Listen up, Gotham. This is Batman. Tune into the Bat Fanatic podcast with Sammy Warmhands. And if you don't, I'll be coming for you. Hey, everybody, it's the Dark Knight of Rap, Sammy Warmhands, and this is the Bat Fanatic podcast. As always, I'm going to be joined by my co hosts, Ben and Evan. I've got a shout out, our longtime sponsor, Radar Toys, right here in Eugene, Oregon. You can go to radartoys.com. Save 10% using the code BATFANPOD and always get free shipping in the U.S. That's RadarToys.com. Now, today, we're going to take our first dive into episodes of Batman the Animated Series. We've done Phantasm and Sub-Zero, the films, but we're going to dig into the show itself, one of my absolute favorite representations of Batman. This is a two-parter. It's called Robin's Reckoning. All right. As an introduction, I posted to Instagram if anyone had any random questions for us on the recording today. And the first one we got was, what is our favorite one-off villain? I thought that was a pretty good question. What is the criteria? That means they were only ever in one thing? or Yeah, you know, like they were not necessarily a recurring role, you know, like lockup or, you know baby doll or I mean personally I think Phantasm for me but you could argue Hush or you know a lot of these underutilized characters I don't think I'm even familiar enough to pick out a character but Phantasm I think would be the one because of the significance of that movie to me and just the character design it's hard to beat man it really is yeah such a good story, and again, like that Shredder vibe with the Grim Reaper hood and everything, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah, I like a skull mask and a hooded character with a knife hand. Yeah. That's kind of almost the only like, one-off I can really think of, because all the other Batman villains, there's like lesser villains, but they all show up here and there. Like I said, I like Lady Shiva. Yeah. I like the idea of, I like lady characters, and I like the character that can can fight Batman on even terms. Mm -hmm. But she's not one-off. She's been around since like the 80s at least. Yeah. And so Phantasm's a pretty good one. Hush was interesting, but I only, I read Hush once years ago. that's one I really want to do on the show. That's Mm. that's a good one. I remember liking it, but I don't think of him as like, yeah, Hush. I like Phantasm Woman more than Hush. (laughs) Phantasm (laughs) Woman. (laughs) All right. So let's get into it. We're doing a a two-parter from Batman the Animated Series, Robin's Reckoning. Uh, These episodes came out in 1993. Uh, Written by Randy Rogel, directed by Dick Sebast. Starring, as always, Kevin Conroy, Lauren Lester, Ephraim Zimbalas Jr., Bob Hastings. We have Tom Wilson, a.k.a. Biff Tannen. Yeah. I think he's uncredited. Tony Zuko. Is Is he? It says his name in the end. Or he was—he uh, did another voice in the show. That's what it was. He did somebody else, and that was uncredited at oh, the same, in that episode. Gotcha. Yeah, they do that sometimes. Where like, I remember in the Man Bat episode on Leather Wings, and it's like a police helicopter, and it's going through the sky, and Man Bat like flies by, and one of the cops in the helicopter is like, "What the heck?" You know, and that was Conroy. You know, so like they'll mm. they'll reuse them for little lines here and there. Okay. I thought you were going to say, he's headed straight for the water tower. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that thing is going to blow. Uh, and then, of course, music by the wonderful Shirley Walker. This is a great place to start out the episode because we haven't actually done anything from the series itself, aside from the spinoffs. So let's talk about this amazing intro. What other stuff has Shirley done besides the Batman franchise? Because I swear I've never heard her name anywhere else. Lots of TV. Yeah, I'm not I really sure. Did the Phantasm, a lot of television work. It had been a really long time since I watched any of the cartoon. I got the instant nostalgia vibes. Not in a, this is only good because I was a little kid way. Yeah. In a, it's still really awesome and I love this style way. And even the intro and the music is so cool and powerful, but then the way that it 
syncs up with all the action is super cool. All the punches being thrown, especially the the building blowing up on the ground floor, just boom, yes. and it gets right to the music. That's so cool. And I also liked a lot of times intros to stuff will be kind of a a montage of different things, just stuff that Batman might do. He might swing yep. from building to building and he might ride a bicycle and stuff like that. <laughs> but what I like is that the intro tells its own little day in the life of Batman mini story. And yep. I think that's really cool. Like so much of his time is spent fighting these super villain guys, but he's also a super cop and randomly just has to take out bank robbers. So I just liked the little open and shut minute long story with the bank robbers. Batman shows up rooftop fight scene comes in Gotham PD guys tied up with a bow for the cops and then Batman triumphant at the top of a building. The end. That's really cool to me. Just kind of open shut Batman story. Well, and basically what you're talking about is they did a, pilot for the show that was like not a full on episode but it was like a minute or two short or something mm -hmm. and it was sort of their pitch you know of like Bruce Tim going like, all right so this is the style this is kind of what we want to do so when they made the intro they basically condensed that standalone mm -hmm. random goons fight thing and kind of wrote the whole intro off of that on the later episodes, it's really frustrating because they started calling it like the adventures of Batman and Robin. And so you'll be watching this season and like halfway through, it'll do that montage intro thing mm. and they won't use the Elfman song. They'll use the theme that's in the show, which is great, the ba 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 ba, you know, like, it's still great, I love it, but when you have the most iconic intro and then turn it into this clip piece with the other song, it's like, what, what the fuck? And it's the same show. And so it'll be like, one episode has Robin on it and you'll get that, and the next episode will be normal again. It's really fucking weird. And then I just started watching the new adventures for the first time, they go back to the original intro. Weird. They redesigned all the characters. Everything looks fucking different, but they at least were like, we're not going to top this. Let's just keep it. <laughs> yeah. That seems weird, though, just for the lack of visual continuity. I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> when you're talking about this pumped up Batman montage, all of a sudden I'm thinking of like the Speed Racer intro. So I'm thinking like, go, go Batman <laughs> or something. Just flying <laughs> fists and car racing and stuff. That just makes me think of Fast Driver when SNL did the parody of Drive, Fast Driver, Drive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing this episode pitch and somebody is like, you see this painted Batman face with these cartoon squinty eyeballs? There's going to be a lot of that. This is going to be a big thing. This is going to be reoccurring right here. <laughs> I actually, I love the look of the ones that are on like streaming now because mm -hmm. I have the old DVDs and they're not really restored in any way. And so there's famously, they talk about it in like the commentaries and shit, that close up of his face on the roof in mm -hmm. every episode, there's this big white mark on his cheek because there was like dirt on the film or something. <laughs> and so it's like the big close up but it kind of looks like shit. And so on the new ones, everything is super sharp and color is touched up and it looks super awesome. Like normally I don't care very much about restorations, but when I started streaming this on DC universe, I was like, Oh my God, I'm never watching my DVDs again. This looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> but when it's all mole, 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 then you just, you just can't stand it. <laughs> Mo. <laughs> Shut up, That's man. That's an Austin Powers reference for anybody who uh, didn't get that. Yeah, baby. Very <laughs> psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> Do I make you horny? So we open with the uh, skyscraper construction site. Robin is kind of out of character being a whiny little bitch. You know, it's like, Do we have to stay here forever? Can't we just go and, you know, like, this dude is in college. 
Um, <laughs> he says, yeah, time to kick some butt. <laughs> yeah, and you think he's probably been Robin for a while at this point, so he'd be used to sitting around just waiting for stuff to happen. Yeah, I think really what they're trying to do is they're setting up this sort of conflict with Batman and Robin because this episode, more than most, he's very stoic and gruff. He's much more Batman-like. Exactly, yeah. There's there's no real soft edge to Batman in this episode. Their interaction in the beginning where he's just, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Robin's just like, just prattling on it. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Is that how you guys are when I start going off about some shit? <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm-hmm. This uh, intro fight scene had some of the best, like, the only thing that kept Batman from breaking his code, not murdering people, was like a conveniently placed crane outside the building because he, he's just like two <laughs> foot kicking people off yeah. the girders into space. <laughs> yeah. so, he's all right. He landed yeah. on the plywood. Yeah, they're the random platforms floating out of the air. Thank God for those. It's funny because I remembered this episode being so good or these episodes being so good, right? And then when I turned it on in the first like three or four minutes, I'm like, wait, it, this is the tone of the, this is <laughs> different than I remember. You know, it's like a bad fight scene where he's like struggling to take out random goons. You know, there's that shitty banter right before that, that we were just talking about. I was like, this is the vibe, but then very quickly it turns super serious, you know. As soon as he tells Robin to go away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And because he like hears that name, I was like, wait a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what was, what the fuck was it? Marin. Oh, Billy Marin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, hang on a Bobby second. Bobby McFerrin? <laughs> Go get the car, you know. And I love the shot where he pushes the guy off. Robin catches him. <laughs> Batman is like hoisting him up. And is like, it's you, me, and 30 stories. You're going to tell me what I want to know. You know, like, <laughs> oh, it's so good. And the, the guy's like, the cops wouldn't leave me here. He's like, we're not the cops. You know, it's it's almost like a little bit of Christian Bale Batman in that. I like hearing Conroy's version of that badass version of himself. Yeah. Because I think Conroy really helped instill the way that, that I've talked about, the way that I picture Batman just not saying a lot, only saying what he needs to, mm-hmm. being so composed that it comes across in his vocal tone. I think a lot of that was extra instilled by Conroy because he has the ability to sound calm and gentle or just kind of straightforward and commanding. And he has a very deep voice, so it's powerful when he's talking slow. Yeah, he doesn't have to yell to have presence. Yeah, I think you hit it with presence because both Keaton and Conroy get the credit for like the two voices. Yeah. You know, Keaton's very minimalist, doesn't say very much, but his is such a visual presence versus Conroy's voice. Like you said, it has this extra resonance and there's something about it that is so commanding that he mm-hmm. can do very little and have it be the most impactful. Mm-hmm. Back to Robin's being snotty in the very beginning. He says something about Batman treats me like a kid and then he immediately kicks a rock like a kid (laughs) and you were just saying that as soon as batman hears the guy's name he's kind of oh shit he knows what might be up and robin shouldn't partake in it yeah but as the audience member you don't know what's going on yet and i wonder if their little interaction in the beginning that made Batman seem like he was kind of tired of Robin already. Like they were just having an off day and Robin was just bugging him. I wonder if that was just to kind of a little me misdirect. So they set the stage like they're just having a day and they're getting on each other's nerves. And then when the guy mentions the name, you think a little less of it because maybe Batman just wants some space and he's like, oh, yeah, this sounds something like I should investigate solo. And and as the audience member, you're like, yeah, well, he just, uh, you know, he's being a dick, kind of. He's he's taking it out, out on Robin. There's probably nothing else to this story. And then it turns out that there is. Yeah, that's an interesting point. 
Because, I mean, he does seem surprised, like they're ready to walk out on this dude. Mm -hmm. And then he says it. And and Batman kind of turns around like, what the fuck do you just say? You know? So, I mean, there is a little bit of that. But, yeah, they, they did set it up well of, like, there's already some kind of dissonance between them, you know, that would make it work when he says, get in the fucking car. Because if they just swoop in and they're like, all right, we're a team and we're blah, blah, blah. And he's like, get in the fucking car. And he's like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. very abrupt. <laughs> Another part that I liked about that scene is that that man grabs... I don't think that they work like this, but he grabs that rivet gun and he's shooting the rivets like a machine gun. Okay, I was going to bring that up because I... That's not, and I thought it was a nail gun, but e either way, that can't be how that works. I mean, I've used a nail gun. <laughs> no, I've built so. a fence. But then I was thinking, well, maybe there weren't all these safety precautions in 1993 because... You know, think about like... <laughs> yeah, OSHA didn't exist in 1993. Well, I think of Happy Gilmore. That came out around this time, like 95, 96, right? And the joke that he shoots his boss in the head with the nail gun when he's target practicing, like, those don't exist like that today. So maybe that was a thing back then. So what I don't know is that you have different safety precautions on different styles of nail guns, say, but one of the really common ones is that the end of it has to be like depressed yeah. to a surface That's in order what I was to thinking. shoot the thing. So like maybe a rivet doesn't, and you could just totally blah, 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 just blast them wildly in the air. <laughs> but I kind of imagine that it has to be pressed up against something, but a rivet is more or less like an incredibly heavy duty nail gun because that's what the skeletal structure of a building like that is like steel I beams. And yeah. then that's what allows you to join I beams together is those rivets. That's just a really long way of you telling me it's not a fucking nail gun. You idiot. Everything steel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that this podcast would necessarily be just about Batman. I think it's actually just a, a learning opportunity and it shows how diverse we all are as individuals. Yeah, this is what people come for is that, you know, I come for Batman, but then I stay for the long sidebars about the structural engineering. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. the history <laughs> of toothbrushes. safety. You know, that's what I stay for is hardware safety over the years. I think it really catches people off guard and, uh, yeah, you didn't expect to to learn something that was real life and practical when we're reading and watching fiction. But here we are, <laughs> dropping all these knowledge bombs. Sam, I don't even understand how how did you manage to pay attention to the rest of this episode when you were just so consumed by this rivet gun, nail gun, would it, won't it? Oh, I had to watch if, the whole thing over again just because I was so distracted by that. You know, <laughs> I had to I watch some go, wait, 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 documentaries. Wait, I gotta go I went to Google, I went to YouTube, I started watching little documentaries, you know. Like, you had to watch all of Happy Gilmore over again. <laughs> <laughs> little like, Nick wait. immediately following. <laughs> it can't be. Um, we get this scene afterward that's brief, but Dick and Bruce in the Batcave, it's the sort of, no, I have to go in on this alone, right? And that's when he's left behind, Dick sits down to the Batcave. I was like, fine, I'm going to look up this Billy Marin motherfucker, see what's going on. And then he sees Tony Zuko. And as a seven-year-old child, I'm not thinking, oh, I'm going, okay. And then it cuts back and it shows you right. the flashback. And so th this is what this show does really well. I chose it because it reminded me sort of of Phantasm and the way that it's told through past and present so effectively you know, he sees as a child the Zuko guy trying to extort the circus. Then he sees this dude later when they're about to go on stage. He's like, hey, that's the guy. And like, shut up, you little bastard. It's time to go on stage, you know. And um, I just really like the way that they thread the needle on this story, you know, and, and especially coming out of Dark Victory where we just had that little silent montage that was so beautiful. I feel like this is an equally powerful telling of that story. I like that uh, that elephant seemed much smarter than an elephant should be. That elephant was watching him do acrobatics and smiling. 
elephants yeah, are pretty smart. They're yeah, smart, I, but I don't I think they look up pretty smile. Smart. You just yeah, took me right are. out of the show with that, you know. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's the only thing use the rivet gun. Everyone has their thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Basically, this whole episode's unrealistic. <laughs> I mean, you're about to say that I haven't spent a lot of time with elephants. Yeah, I, correct. I, that. I, I'm extremely offended. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, either that or you have it, you just don't do the kind of things that make elephants smile. <laughs> he actually does the <laughs> Elephant <laughs> Fanatic podcast separate from this. That's, that's his other hobby is... I play video games and I make them watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree, Sam. I think that I love the two episode mini story and the way that they infuse the flashbacks at good times does really remind me of Phantasm and is really effective in the storytelling. Also, this verse is like Batman and Robin and Robin is already looks like an adult yeah. character. You know, you know, generally he's a little kid. And one thing that you can't really gather from comic books so much is his parents in this seem like genuinely kind and compassionate people. And yeah, for sure. They seem warm. They do. They, you know, his mom's like holding his shoulders and encouraging him or something, or like his, you know, dad would touch his shoulder or something like that. Like they genuinely care for this person and that much harder to lose somebody who is such like a warm, caring presence in your life. Yeah, they do a really good job in the time that they had on screen. Mm -hmm. Despite the uh, child endangerment. <laughs> Uh, after a short amount of research, it would seem that a rivet gun might, in fact, <laughs> fire continuously as long as you held the trigger down and would only have a real safety feature if you installed one. And I wouldn't be surprised if back in the day that wasn't even an option. We need to get these automatic rivet guns off the streets. Yeah, yeah. Don't you dare try to take away my God-given rivet guns, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> that's my it's my privilege as a Caucasian Christian American to own as many automatic rivet guns as I want to. <laughs> oh good. Um I also like in that scene that when they announce Bruce Wayne is in the house and the spotlight cuts over to him, he's like, Time to put it on. And he fucking like dumps his popcorn while he's trying to wave and like knocks over his soda and like tries to yeah. catch him over the side and, like oh well shucks you know oh, that bumbling idiot <laughs> like how's that fucking guy so rich it's just because of his parents it'd be awesome if his instincts kicked in and he spilled all of his popcorn but then also snatched each popcorn out of midair <laughs> with a two finger like that, oops, that's like a Toby Maguire Spider-Man in the in the yeah. cafeteria where he like catches all the shit oh yeah so then we get the uh undercover scene which when i was taking my notes i was like oh yeah yeah matches malone matches malone but then as the scene goes on they're like you ask a lot of fucking questions for somebody we never seen like What's your name? And he's like, Smith. And I thought, wait, that's weird. Because I, I knew he used that other alias, but maybe it was just a one-off or something they came to later. But John Smith. Yeah. Don't think anything funny about me. That wouldn't be <laughs> Sergeant <laughs> Smith, would it? ordinary about that. So what do you think about the voices in this scene? Because, uh, you know, I like the uh, stereotypical you know, godfathery voices, and you didn't like that in The Dark Knight. So does it work for oh, you in a cartoon? Yeah, this upsets me just like The Dark Knight, deeply. <laughs> deeply. I, uh, I had to so corny. I, I had to cut myself just to get rid of the anxiety. <laughs> uh, no, I think it works with it, because this show has that vibe of, like, classic mobster throughout it. Yeah. So it works fine. I mean, that was my only gripe, is that he's not matches Malone, but otherwise. Yeah. They all, oh, is it age? Is it, uh, what does he say? Is it... Is that Detective Smith? Yeah. Maybe Sergeant? Yeah, I like that. That's a good line, honestly. It works in this. It doesn't work in a super hardcore, fucking realistic, <laughs> modern crime thriller. <laughs> well, and also, the cool thing about this sequence is that there's 
an instant change into Batman. And so like he beats up and scares off all the other guys except the one dude who then before he even turns around, he sees the silhouette of Batman, the shadow lurking over him. He's like, oh, fuck. And again, like you were saying about the intro, like, all right, we're going to have tons of this. You know, we get the knuckle cracking. He doesn't say uh-huh. anything. He's just like, oh, fuck. <laughs> this, this guy is in the wrong place tonight. John Smith is a real badass. <laughs> Loves torture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't tell if that was a gripe or not either with like how quickly he changed. But I was like, that's all right. He's Batman. He had his costume on underneath that. And it's like a breakaway hobo outfit. And he just <laughs> pulls it. <laughs> and then he quickly threw his cowl on over it. And was ready. Yeah, it's not like when he was that old lady and it was so much prosthesis <laughs> that he had to fight as the old lady, you know. Yeah, he has to take off his dirty alley jacket and then his pink robe and then he has his bat suit on underneath it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's like, fake boobs for the old lady costume. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> keeps those on. Yeah. <laughs> he keeps them in the what utility I, belt. What am I thinking of? Like Mrs. Doubtfire or something where somebody in a movie is rocking some like fake fabric titties. I, I feel like it's Mrs. Doubtfire. Mrs. Doubtfire. There's a little yeah. bit of that in Wild West also, but more Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah, I think it's Mrs. Doubtfire. That's what I'm thinking of. That just makes me think of something about Mary. <laughs> The old ladies. Fucking. Oh, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. leathery. Yeah. Leather. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, so then we come back, and uh, Bruce is in the cave going like, all right, I'm on this dude's case. You know, like, he's got my full attention. And Alfred's like, may I remind you how fucked up you were as a kid when this happened? Like, don't you think you should pay a little attention to the child and get to the revenge later, you know? And they have this nice little scene that's kind of uh, in front of the portrait of the Waynes on the wall, you know, where it's like, you know, I could have saved them, I should have done something, and, you know, we're just painfully reminded that they are the exact same person in this way, and, and only he's lived to tell about it, you know? He has a chance to answer it quickly this time. If yes. only he can catch the guy and do whatever he has to do but also just to say like i know literally what you're experiencing here and like it's not your fault because he to this day feels like you've said you know i have this guilt from not stopping or whatever and so he's trying to make sure that that doesn't happen as these feelings are forming for the first time i think that's the big difference too is it's not that bruce didn't have somebody in his life he had alfred yeah Dick would have the benefit of having Alfred and Bruce if they were both around, but what Bruce didn't have was somebody who actually experienced a very similar scenario. Exactly. And Dick does have that if Bruce could be that person for him. You say that, but you don't know Alfred. Probably his parents were murdered too in front of him. <laughs> that's why he became a butler. Yeah, his, uh, his father was murdered by the Court of Owls, remember? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That existed at this time. Um, There's probably some cool... Um, uh, what's, his, what's his face? The guy who designed the look of this whole thing. Bruce Tim. Bruce Tim. yeah. There's probably some great Bruce Tim sketches from the early 90s of, you know, the Talon and an Owl Man. Owl <laughs> Man. <laughs> I can't remember exactly what I'm thinking of right now, but it, it's something, it's like a plot device that gets used in dramas and stuff all the time. But Amnesia. Yeah, but this like entire Robin thinking that Batman is being a dick thing could just be remedied if they would just have a conversation about what Batman was. But you wouldn't have an episode, you wouldn't have a story if the people just communicated. But like it happens all the time where I I just feel like, yo, why don't you just have a talk and skip all this bullshit? I don't like misunderstandings and I don't like miscommunication and it's really frustrating for me to watch this stuff when I want to say things and I want them to be intercepted as I intend them and I want to take other people at their word and I don't want to like hide things like that. So then watching people like, nope, this is definitely going to play out way better if I just strike out and do this (laughs) on my own and don't explain myself to this kid. He'll totally get what I'm trying to do here. You know, like 
why don't you just have a talk? Well, it's the <laughs> whole it like just talk to each other. second act problem, you know, when they need to drive a wedge between characters. It even happens in comedies, you know, where a uh, romantic comedy or something like, oh, they thought they caught this person with another girl or something, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's not what actually happened. That's what it looked like, right? And then instead of just saying, well, it looked like that because I was doing X, Y, and Z. This is actually my disabled sister. They did. <laughs> I, I have to take care of her. Yeah. Day, yeah. So. That's why I was under her dress. I was helping her get dressed, you know. And so the, you've always got to have this. Shit. Is this a Farrelly Brothers movie that we're talking about? I don't know. <laughs> but, like, they're always dancing around the truth and trying to say, like, the softest, easiest workaround instead of just saying, well, this is what happened, you know? And it, it always happens. It gets me too when I'm watching shit. It's like, you could have just said the fucking thing and then she wouldn't be pissed at you for the next three months that we got to have a montage through now. Yeah. I agree with you. It is a little bit just kind of like a lazy storytelling gimmick, but I give it a little bit of a pass because it fits with the character of Batman that I know, which is like modern Batman. The idea of someone who doesn't tell other people enough who always yeah. tries to do everything on his own sure oh yeah it he, works. He, he, could, he could have been like this is really important you have to trust me on this i have to go do this instead of just being rude yeah i think that the dude who was involved in your parents murder might have something to do with the thing that we're currently working on i think it'll be a little too much for you maybe you should sit this out please see but, but again trust him. if you say that then he's going to be, wait, what? I'm definitely going, you know. So. Yeah, exactly. he does yeah, he it. does it anyways, though. But it's the drama. Yeah. <laughs> when, he, right. when he does his detective work. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> when he does his detective work of typing the name in the back of the computer. <laughs> Some deep research. Yeah. Well, it's research. Safety features on rivet guns. <laughs> You know, this is this is information I assume that he has built up over the years of being the detective. Of, he has this database now, you know. Yeah, that doesn't bother me. I just think that's like poor planning on his part. If he's going to try and block Robin out to not <laughs> cover that up somehow, or oh, yeah. put a but password on the computer. Here's my password, <laughs> I though. I hope he doesn't use the same research computer that I use to discover <laughs> yeah. this man's identity. <laughs> that's pretty good. There's only one. I hope he doesn't think to use it. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, because he's kind of not giving him enough credit as his protege. <laughs> he's, he's like a super ass kicker, but he doesn't know how to turn on a computer. Well, he doesn't then, know how to type. Then he gets the scene where he realizes that Robin is tracking him. So he, like, switches the shit off. Then we kind of immediately jump back in time. We don't really see where Robin goes instead. Gordon comes over to the house and was like, well, we, you might not have to keep the boy, you know? Um, it's like, I, we're really close to Zuko. And uh, you see the kid through the door going like, oh, shit, I'm going to get given away now? Like, they don't mm -hmm. spend too much time on it, but it is a real threat. <laughs> They're going to make that elephant take care of me. Uh, she's <laughs> all right. She keeps fucking with me. <laughs> <laughs> they only pay me in peanuts at the circus. It's exactly what the elephant likes. <laughs> Takes all my money. <laughs> Since they explained that Zuko's a flight risk, Dick's like, I'm going to go after him. No training, no Robin, just a child going after this dude. And so we see him kind of going around the streets in these shitty neighborhoods with a picture like, have you seen this goon? You know, and I also thought, do you guys notice the voice of the bus driver being a little bit... It's like a black man. Incongruous. Yeah, because it's like this yeah. Mr. Feeney-looking white guy with a gray mustache, and then you get, like, it's basically uh, Michael K. Williams from The Wire. He voices this dude on um, Bill Burr's cartoon on Netflix, F is for Family. It's like that exaggerated 70s character coming out of a round-faced, gray-haired white guy on the bus. <laughs> I was like, yeah, what is strange. happening right now? <laughs> and then we get this scene that is, I don't really know what it's for, but I like it. Maybe it's character building on Dick's part. But he sees a pimp smacking around a girl, taking her money, and uh, intervenes. I thought that was kind of random, but uh, it's sort of like a, a year one fish out of water. Like you say, showing his character that like, even though he's trying to do something else, that's wrong. He doesn't even think like, oh, I'm a little kid. Yeah. I can't do anything about this. He just goes in to stop it. 
Yeah. I think that's the case also. It's trying to show on his own that's what you would do to that's that's his character and that's his merit. He's a stand up kid. And it's courageous. And he's good for that role because of these reasons. And then the girl he, takes he him likes out. Babes. <laughs> it's a horny bugger. <laughs> And then the girl takes him out to the diner and the waitress gives a little too much information. I like it. She's like, oh, I know this asshole. He comes in here and he doesn't tip me, right? Like, all right, I get that. And then she's like, yeah, I've seen him come from that abandoned building across the pond. It's like, but you couldn't see that guy coming from half a mile away. Every day, yeah. same time. 12 bucks down around a million corners. I know, I know exactly where it comes from. <laughs> Points out the window. Yeah, he went that away, you know. Oh, yeah, Bobby Mirren, the boss. I think I saw him up there by the <laughs> diner. <laughs> when Batman shows up, we get this great scene where Dick, again, who is not Robin yet, looking up at the Batwing coming down from the sky. <laughs> he takes it back to the cave. Kid asks, who are you? And he just takes his fucking mask off. That's a pretty cool reveal. It kind of reminds me of like the opposite of Phantasm when he first puts the mask on and Alfred's like, holy shit, you know, it has that same kind of resonance of like, mm. well, I'm letting you in, like it or not. Whoa. Yeah. An important part of the scene just before that, Batman has Zuko and Robin's there, but then Robin gets like hit and knocked into the canal. So Batman <laughs> has to dive in and save him, which gives up Zuko, which kind of then gives another place for Robin to have guilt. Like Zuko could have been caught if I let him deal with this. Like it's his fault. Yeah, it wasn't before, but now it is. Yeah, that's part of my notes too, and specifically because Robin says, "You had him. You let him go. Why? Like because of you, (laughs) dumbass. You fell in the water. (laughs) I would have had that dude otherwise. You're not very smart. You can't be mad, stupid. Like, do you remember like 30 seconds ago when we went off a fucking waterfall? That, that's why. Why, I, why are my pants wet, Batman? You let him go. Why? <laughs> Butthead? Uh, Proceeds to kick another rock. I like how decrepit Gotham is that he just leans on a rail and it goes over. <laughs> and yet the same thing happens when you flash forward and grown-up Robin catches him again. This time, it's uh, Zuko that's like, backing up, backing up, backing up, and he leans on the the rail there, on the pier, and he also falls through it, <laughs> and Robin has to catch him. It's like... <laughs> the rivet guns don't have safety. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's a terrible place to work. No, I was him. thinking more like we, Jack Nicholson Joker, where he's like, they don't make him like they used to, and he's just kicking yeah. apart the bricks. Never touch another man's rhubarb. I mean, we've talked about how Rub. old Gotham is. It's an ancient city. Secondly, again, OSHA standards didn't exist in 93 slash the 1920s. <laughs> There's a failing. Don't, I mean, don't even touch a handrail in Gotham. It's, everybody knows that. The whole time Evan's watching this show, he's just like, what year is it? <laughs> My God. They got voice activated computers, man. Hover jets. Yeah. How old is this boy, man? I don't understand. <laughs> The future past is a confusing time. I like this little bit for um, the trifecta for Detective when they show Robin digging around trying to find Zuko. You know, it's in the present tense now. He decides to redial the phone that's sitting in this office. And he puts this clunky little thing that says Tracer on it. And uh, I like that, though. He just dials it up. Zuko answers the phone like, yeah, what do you want, you know? Figures out his location. It's maybe not the most realistic thing, but I like that they're going through the motions of all this detective stuff, even in Robin's case, without Batman around. I like that stuff a lot. A little behind-the-scenes action? Yeah. I think also it's just a practical thing, like because you could have the exact same device but with a much more detailed readout that looked more complicated, but you wouldn't be able to see what any of it said because it was on a tiny TV 30 years ago. So just having it be big letters like, this is the address. Yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) I like that uh, when Zuko hears something, and it's sort of like when 
he's packing his shit in the flashback and Dick accidentally kicks a can outside when he's kind of spying on him. The same sort of thing, he hears a sound and realizes, oh shit, I think Batman's here. And he picks up a Tommy gun and wastes the entire clip shooting the walls and ceiling to the extent that when Batman falls, he cannot shoot him because he's shot so much of the property just trying to find him. That's what I think is so funny. I rewound it after watching it (laughs) because I like the... Batman doesn't immediately fall from the ceiling. The ceiling and him don't come at the same time. So there's this mini delay because he, he wasn't sure if he was really up there. He kind of suspected, but is he being paranoid? So he just wastes like the whole drum, all the rounds are gone. And Batman doesn't immediately fall, makes it seem like maybe he wasn't there. <laughs> but I timed it. He shoots his bullets for 17 seconds. <laughs> 17 seconds That's a of lot. continuous bullet shooting. And then when he goes to shoot Batman again, he's like surprised that, <laughs> that like, but look, like there's not more bullets. Like how many rounds are supposed to be in this thing? And you just shot it for 17 <laughs> seconds straight. Like, <laughs> no, dude, there isn't any more dummy. This also know. has the thing that the animated series is bad with. And we've talked about before where sometimes this is the Batman we know. And other times this is the Batman that like one guy punches him and he falls down and he's out of the fight. So that guy shot all those bullets for that much time. And either he hit Batman a bunch, and that's why he fell down and had trouble. <laughs> and or now he didn't he's hit dead. Batman at all. And just the fall from the ceiling to the floor completely winded and stunned the master martial artist ninja guy to the point where now he's just kind of like vulnerable on all fours. I got the feeling that he got tagged in the leg or something like he's shown holding his leg the Peter Griffin thing. He just hit his leg. Yeah, maybe it's just the, the uh, yeah, maybe it's just the fall because there isn't blood and they don't show anything about him getting shot. So yeah, maybe he sprained his ankle in the fall. And, I think that's what it is because he has uh, a splint later when they're on the dock. Uh, um, he's kind of limping up to him. Yeah, that's more conducive to a fall than it is to a bullet wound. That makes sense. But one thing that I noticed since you mentioned it, you know, I'm watching the first season of the new Batman Adventures. He's not that lousy fighter on that show. Like, he's doing the very, like, few moves, most efficient fighting style, taking everybody down, and then a mm-hmm. guy sneaks up behind him and he just lifts the fists like Michael Keaton and punches him out. Like, he's much more effective in that, like, because I think it's set later on and he's more adept. So it's noticeably better than the original animated series? Yes, which surprised me, because, yeah. again, I had not seen the revamped show at all, and I was like, okay, this motherfucker can fight now, and I, I like that quite a bit more. Well, like the choreography in the fights in this, or like the, the intro fight at the construction site, the choreography is still good. Like the yeah. judo and jujitsu moves he's doing. Yeah. But yeah, he's just not like that good compared to what we expect for Batman. Compared yeah. to what it seems like he becomes in the next series. I think retroactively they sort of establish he's more experienced there. Therefore, this is earlier on. Uh, yeah, that's like. Even though- Robin's 25 already. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. he's more like 19, but yeah. In the Phantasm, they actually give you those flashbacks to show the very beginning of his career. Yeah. But it's possible that this is also in the beginning-ish of his career as Batman, not necessarily the first year or something. And I, I don't know. We have talked about how in other versions of Batman, he is already experienced by the time he becomes Batman. So I'm not really sure what the excuse for that is. You kind of have to disregard that. Like, uh, he started just, practicing martial arts when he became Batman. <laughs> I think it's just poor characterization. Because the alternative that this version of Batman just isn't that good of a fighter doesn't make sense to me. Because that's sort of the whole crux of the character. Yeah. Is that he's, he's a man, but he's just so good that he can do all these ridiculous things. And if you take that away, it doesn't really work anymore. Mm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think that a lot of that stuff was assigned retroactively because if they thought about this shit going into it, they didn't think they're going to be making for decades shit that's Uh still tied in to what they're doing on a Fox Kids show in 1992. Sure. You know. I wonder if it's at all related to the capabilities of like the animation team at the time. Though it doesn't make a ton of sense because you've certainly had cartoons that would have existed before it, like even 
Thundercats or anything like that. But style is so important in this. And certainly there is plenty of action, but it isn't like incredibly dynamic necessarily. And part of me wonders if they're just, it's more style and it's more visuals than it is actual like action choreography animation capability. I mean, you can have all those things and still have him win the fight, but I I think it's just the fact that you need to feel he's struggling in some way and that Mm -hmm. these are actual worthy adversaries because if he can just walk into any room and take out all the goons, then what's he left to do but backhand the penguin and take him in? It's it, yeah. it'd be over too quick. But I mean, you're right. But that's what Batman does. Yeah. The way they make it work is by having it be like exciting and interesting choreography as to how he takes out a room full of guys. Because mm-hmm. sometimes in the comics they will have him do that. Where he'll, there's one of my favorite ones, and I can't remember if it's from Hush. Partway through his investigation, he has to take on like in their barracks a squad of like elite soldiers. And it's just him fighting them hand to hand in this room. And it's awesome. And he takes them all up. And like, it doesn't make sense. But, or it's not that it doesn't make sense, but he doesn't have that tension of like, oh, is he in any danger? But it's still really entertaining to watch. For sure. So that's where I think it's more like how he does the crazy things he does is a more interesting take than let's just make him weak. But it, it almost feels like a old school Batman serial, like the mm-hmm. old school Superman serials. Well, it's a little bit like the 60s Adam West sort of fight scenes, you know, where it's like he's not the master martial artist. He's Batman, kids, you know. Yeah. You're right, though. You can't, it would be sort of hard to simultaneously be exercising your, like, combat supremacy and simultaneously struggling with something. So you're either destroying the room full of ninjas or... You're having a hard time with the ice cream man, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite one off Batman villain. The ice cream man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The <laughs> dreaded, I, yeah, I forgot about that one. Well, Ev had a big uh, issue with the exploding ice cream cone in Dark Victory. So, or no, in Nightfall. That's what it was. Nightfall. They just didn't explain it. You know, I was like, they give you a Hello Kitty mug and a like, plastic ice cream cone. It was Tell like one of those up. when you're a kid and you have the toy one where you push a button and it like pops the ice cream ball in the air and it's foam, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like that, but you push the button and it's a bomb. But it destroys the toll booth and the bridge and stuff instead. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, there you go. It's a detonator. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I Um, mean, if somebody would just tell me that, then, (laughs) you know, that's all I need. I'm just like Ben, you know, Ben needs his little, like, science montage and stuff, and I need, like, you know... Joker goes to the place where he stores his nuclear missiles and also <laughs> creates a, an explosive ice cream cone. There's a skull and crossbones on the freezer as he lifts it up. And then you know yeah, something exactly. is up with that ice cream. Yeah, Robin's got his phone tracing little block. You know, give me the behind the scenes. I need that BTS. Now he goes to that place in A Death in the Family where he keeps his nuke in that warehouse. Yes, exactly. And then he opens the cupboard and, oh, oh shit. <laughs> Then we get a beautiful cameo of the Ayatollah handing yeah. ice cream. Cone. Hey, what's up, everybody? <laughs> yeah. So back to the present tense. <laughs> nope. Another thing I like about this is the finale takes place in the amusement park. Normally, that would be a Joker gag, but this feels very. There was a Dirty Harry sequel that had a similar resolution that was in like Coney Island or something like that. And it was this like beaten down old amusement park. And it just has this, the right kind of vibe for it. I don't know. I think it works really well without being a Joker set. And I also like when uh, they're on the carousel and the guys are trying to get to him, to Batman. And Zuko comes up with the Tommy gun And he's like, sorry, boys. And he's just about to machine gun everyone. He's like, my bad. And then he's about to just machine gun his own people (laughs) to How am I going to spend my check? Kill me, man. I don't even get that. Exactly. (laughs) What a dick. But yeah, I like the whole setup, though. Yeah. In a carnival scene, Batman hobbles off and jumps into a, a little carnival game that's called the Sitting Duck Shooting Gallery. Nice. That's good. 
I can't. I, I, like, yeah, I, didn't I like that. Ri- yeah, That's it's good. good. I like words. <laughs> um, I couldn't remember I, if it was in this or it, it had to have been in this or Curse of the White Knight. But there's a there's a scene that shows like the cityscape and there is a Statue of Liberty like out in the water. And we're always talking about like where is Gotham? Like, yeah. what is this place? And this Statue of Liberty, like, very clearly <laughs> makes it look like a certain place. It's the Statue of Lady Kansas. It's right in the middle of Lake Kansas. <laughs> Gotham is on the shores of Lake Kansas in Kansas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yep. man. Fair enough. Debunked. <laughs> Moving on. Now, coming out of the amusement park scene, Robin shows up. It's kind of like in Batman Returns when the bat ski boat comes and decapitates the duck as Penguin's driving. You know, the fucking mm. motorcycle just flies right over his head like it's going to land on him. So Zuko starts shooting at it, but the base of the motorcycle is protecting him. And I love how Robin fucking grabs it by his shirt collar as soon as he lands and drags this motherfucker down the pier and spins out and throws him like that was such Mm -hmm. a badass fucking move i love they gave him that little cool action moment when ultimately he's gonna have to step down they still give him this cool bad guy ass kicking thing you know yeah that part is badass he's not the helpless little kid anymore that whole his final confrontation with zuko is like that because anything zuko does to stop him he just immediately deflects or defends against because he's basically little Batman. I'm looking at my notes and actually <laughs> it says so ducking badass. I didn't catch the auto correct there. You're just trying to clean it up. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. I want to keep those ratings high and watch my yeah. fucking mouth. Five stars mon- plus. Monkey fighting goons come up to Batman and they're like, shiz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot dang. Well, because I watched this a while ago and uh, we rescheduled, I watched it again just now before we started. And uh, Ange was laughing, sitting next to me when Batman's holding the guy in the beginning who's hanging. And he's like, listen here, scum bucket. And she's like, scum bucket. (laughs) Oh, I can't even remember where it is. It all must have been like very near the beginning. Pretty sure it's Batman, but I just have four lines in a row that are quoted lines, and the very last one is, you don't want to see me grumpy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, fuck. That's when he goes to so that Stromwell hard. guy, and he puts the uh, the tracker under his chair. It sucks, because that is such an awesome, serious, noir scene, and then it ends with that line. Again, that's the funny parallels of what's acceptable in terms of things you say and what's acceptable in terms of things you show. So it's like, you don't want to see me grumpy. And that's about all they can get away with. And then we're going to watch him probably about to torture someone by beating them until they (laughs) confess. That's cool. Well, it's weird though, because you could have played that slightly more seriously just by saying angry, but then they're like, well, but the Hulk says that we can't say that. And instead of going back and rewriting the line, they'll just like, eh, make him say grumpy. You don't want to see me get crazy. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> oh, man. I really, really, really like the closing bit. Robin wants to throw him off the pier. Batman shows up. The cop cars are showing up. It's all coming to a head. Just like a great action movie would kind of wind up, you know, like he makes the right call. You know, he pulls him back to safety. And there's that great line where he's not decided to let him off yet. And he's like, you don't know how I feel. You could never understand. And then actually makes eye contact with him for a second and realizes how fucking stupid and self-centered that was to say. And that was kind of the tipping point that's like, fuck. Yeah, you do, and you're right. God damn it. For sure. And then they close with the best possible Batman shit where Robin's like, you know, you were right, and you knew that it would be too much for me, and Bruce turns his back, puts his head down, 
and says, Zuko's taken so much, caused you so much pain, I could stand the thought that he might take you too. And that really shows that despite them butting heads and all this other shit leading up to it, in his own way, he was only trying to protect him. And that just gives so much more heart in the last 10 seconds or something before it fades into the sunrise, you know? Yes, instead of it just being, you can't handle this, you're not skilled enough yet. Yeah, that's the brilliance of the show is that for all the nitpicking that we do, it's got this awesome noir detective vibe through it. And, I mean, fuck, for a two-parter on a kid's series, I mean, this is... It's a really great episode, and you feel satisfied, but then they give you that extra little thing being like, no, guys, we really get it. We want to do this as good as the comics would do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that last bit just really drove it home for me. I think a big thing with Batman is, like we talked about, his lack of explaining himself or feeling like he needs to or being accustomed to it or anything, especially in this case. If you were just flying solo, then then whatever, who do you care about? What's your goal? You're very focused. But in this case, his, his actions are dictated by his whatever form of love for Dick. <laughs> I was oh, waiting for so a Dick joke. Ah, I got mature. I yeah. got to go. <laughs> I need to leave. Um, sorry. <laughs> Senor Grayson. <laughs> Somebody's sitting home with that Batman bingo that I just made. And yeah. we have a whole episode where he said dick like 49 times. And they're like, they're dick not going to make a joke. Give me the fucking square. <laughs> Come on already. Well, there Richard's you go. Richard's fondness. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's easy to forget that he's capable of those kind of things. He's, you're always seeing him fight criminals. He's always being very frank. He's being aggressive. Seems kind of devoid of all this stuff. But really his whole persona is rooted in feelings and trauma and you know piled up scars and stuff and so that's what this stuff really needed anyways was dick needed that explanation like where are you coming from dude and so to have him not even like beat around the bush and really just kind of give a sentence of just really sharing his feelings with him is super nice and really shows that that he's capable and that's where he's coming from and how could you argue against that? You know, he, he loves me. I appreciate how concise it is. That's the benefit of writing stuff. Nobody talks like people in movies because you have the benefit of Flaming refining up. stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and making it as concise as possible. And I just like how straightforward his sharing is. And then also considering that this is something that a lot of children were seeing, even if adults also liked it and, the people who were children ended up being adults and continued to like it. There's that element of let's sneak in the good life lessons also. Yeah. You know, teamwork, sharing, compassion, blah, blah, blah. Family. Yeah, family. So to sneak in that little life lesson sentimentality at the end is is very nice. Well, I also like looking at it that way too, which I hadn't, because then it's also showing however many millions of children look up to Batman is like, what a tough person is. How, how to be tough. The idea that that guy can also be emotionally vulnerable. Totally. And if just in general and society, that should be what a man is capable of, like handling his business, speaking up for himself, protecting other people, able to have feelings and share feelings. That's like the spectrum. He's a character that's larger than life, but he's also just a good example of a man. So you're telling me Batman is on the spectrum? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, possibly. He's, like, he's fucking wears his underpants on the outside. <laughs> Single All minded. Right. Wears his underwear on the outside. Those two alone would already. Yeah, so something's up. Really into his hobbies and interests. Yeah, look at the people that he hangs out with. Like, are these bad guys or are those his weird buddy friends he's playing some stupid game with? <laughs> So that's a good segue into Easter eggs because my <laughs> only Easter egg was about the suit and that is that in the flashbacks he looks a little more like the Killing Joke year one black chested logo a little more no frills than the brightly colored suit that we see. My only Easter egg is not really an Easter egg. There's just a part in the second episode 
with a paper boat and Amber and I just watched the it movies. It's in the, there's a paper boat in it. I would not know this. But what? Come on. I don't do horror. Actually, for ha- for Halloween, this is the first time in years I watched any horror. They had, I know what you did last summer on uh, yeah. HBO or something, and I was like, I, I had just talked about it because I have the soundtrack from it. Because <laughs> all those movies, they'd have like one song from a band that was a B-side or something. I'd be like, ah, got to get that. Um, mm-hmm. But I haven't done like slasher movies in 20 years or something, and so uh, it was enjoyable to go back and watch that. I like horror movies a lot lately and not because I like scary stuff or gore or anything, but I happen to think that horror movies are pushing the portion of like cinema that's really artistic lately. And they're providing a lot of like really cool imagery and really cool color treatments and really interesting ideas. And so I've found myself just gravitating towards them because of the style of all of these films lately. That makes sense. And the old it is awesome and funny and classic, and the new ones are freaking awesome. And they're a good version of the old one being like a, a single really long movie because it tells the story of these kids' life and then them as adults closing the book on this bad stuff. It's like a three hour then, movie, right? It's what? Isn't it like a three hour movie? Yeah, the first one is like a three hour movie, and then the. It aired multiple nights on television. Yeah, oh. and then the new ones are like two, I don't remember how long they are, but they're long, they're two, two, two to three hours, both of them, Yeah, um, s- split into two instead, and it has some of the best recasting, like time-lapse adults playing the children, it has like the best adult casting well, that I've seen in it. Yeah, man, I saw the trailer for It too in the theater, and before you realize what it is, I'm like... Oh, fuck. Jessica Chastain. Oh, Bill Hader. Oh, like all these people. And it's showing the child version to them. And I was like, fuck, this casting is awesome. Like, what is this movie? And then it shows what it is. I'm like, nope. (laughs) (laughs) I just, yeah, I'm too squeamish for all the the gore. But any spicy food, you can develop a taste for it. Yeah. Just have to expose yourself (laughs) repeatedly (laughs) to all the horrendous stuff. Yeah. And eventually it becomes easier. Numb your senses and your. See, you're relating that in a way that implies I would understand that trying other foods oh, would allow me to appreciate it. It's like a really great cheese pizza or macaroni and cheese or maybe <laughs> buttered bread. Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a great buttered bread, like kind of different from the buttered bread you've had before. But still. Yeah, but yeah. Do you ever want to yeah. try different bread or different <laughs> butter, though? Pros? <laughs> I like American cheese. That's my problem. <laughs> Caucasian white god American cheese. <laughs> uh, the animation, as always, it's just like splendid. I'd forgotten they did the little title screens before the episodes. Yeah, I love the title that is cards. Super cool to me. The intro is just as powerful as always, and the style is super awesome. And it, I continue to like it, and it reminds me of a time when that was new to me and how cool it was then but then all those little elements including the little title screen the the little musical intro you know that painted single frame and it always has that like art deco lettering and it's yeah just like everything about what they're presenting to us and the style of all of it is so cool there's even a book that just came out that's like just the title cards and like updated versions of the title cards oh Um, cool they're pretty cool it feels like a um in line with old Looney Tunes, Warner Brothers cartoons. Yeah. Where they would all uh, and even along with that and before that, like just the way shorts, the idea of shorts, it'd be like a 20 minute thing before a movie or a little, oh, yeah. the Three Stooges all do it. Just old, old shorts all had little title cards for their 20 minute presentation. And it just makes it feel more classic. That's true. Plus, we weren't keeping track of episodes back in the day. We were just like digesting them as like, oh yeah, I got off of school and here's a new episode and that kicked ass and you remember the storyline. So if you were telling your friend, you'd be like, oh, did you see the episode of Batman where the robot Clayface swallows him? And we didn't have the benefit of like DVDs or anything that would have episode listings. Yeah. You know, so you couldn't be like, oh yeah, episode three where blah happens. So giving it a title 
gives you something more easy to remember. You know, that way you can say like Robin's Reckoning rather than trying to remember the number or the action or something like that. It gives it something to like, this is a legitimate story and here's something for you to remember the name of. That's true because I think that there's certain ones that really stand out. I, you know, Heart of Ice comes to mind as being the most iconic from this. And if you were to just say like, oh, the Mr. Freeze episode... And then, oh, which one? You know, the original yeah. one. Oh, yeah, the original one was the best. No, there's none of that. You say the words Heart of Ice, and everyone's like, yeah. You sure. know exactly what that is. I don't even know what you're talking about. What? Yeah, who's That's... Senor Frio? I don't know. I, <laughs> I, mean, I, I can't think of the episode. I don't know. Oh, that's I'm sure like, I watched all this stuff then, but I don't even know. I don't know what that is. Well, I guess we got to do another one of these because that's like the most famous <laughs> one. You know that? Like you're as cold as ice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's where it comes from. Oh, yeah. So mine are the detective story with a lot of heart, the phantasm like use of flashbacks, really satisfying conclusion. And then, of course, even though I've grown kind of numb to it because I just watch this show all the time, but best cast, composer, art direction ever. You know, just legendary team. Undisputed. Cons? So you're going to hate me more than you do now. I'm out. <laughs> uh, Kevin Conroy, a little bit. And what? let me explain. Put your gun away and let me explain <laughs> it for just a second. It's So I watched these cartoons when I was younger and then a couple of years ago I watched some of Batman Beyond and so he reprises his role as Bruce Wayne uh, I'm then, listening my, uh, most of my experience within the past 10 years or more of Kevin Conroy's Batman is the Arkham games Yeah, and he's great in that like he has all the presence, the power he's just he's excellent and then watching this and I don't remember thinking this in Phantasm so maybe it wasn't an issue or I just wasn't thinking of it but this, and there's the, the kind of the first Two Face episode. There's a scene that really highlights it for me. He sounds like he has a cold, both in terms of like he kind of sounds a little, a little nasally, a little bit, but also he talks very slow and he's just not very forceful. Where in the Arkham games and the modern stuff, even Batman Beyond, there's more energy to his performance. It's just kind of lacking compared to what I have come to expect from him. Well, the Two-Face one that stands out to me is right after Two-Face gets half his face blown off. And it's an amazing scene on every level, like the animation, the way it's shot. But he looks at it and he goes, Harvey, no. <laughs> That's just, a fucking awesome scene. You could fuck it's, yourself. It is awesome, but that, that delivery compared to what he does later as Batman, I'm just not that into it. Is that where Christian Bale drew influence from, like, the plugged nose Maybe <laughs> the Batman thing is it is actually like a throwback the whole time. Yeah, he researches the roles. But do you think that you are in? I mean, granted, I don't know what Conroy did before this stuff, so maybe it's like kind of early on in his voice acting career. Theater. He did theater before this. Okay, so it's possible that that's like early on in his career, so his performances aren't as good as they would be twenty years later for these games. So maybe he's just better. But I also wonder how much of it is related to just the way that you absorb that stuff. Like, yeah. I think I think maybe you're having more fun playing the games and you like that visual representation of Batman and possibly the writing also more than you like the animated series Batman. And so the whole thing, it's like the package is what really sells you on it. There's definitely some of that. But no, I mean, I think if you... If you listen to his vocal performance from this and then anything from the games, it's just a better performance. And the quality of the recording is better, so that's probably part of it. But sure. just his performance is better. The same character, just a better performance. And having no experience with the games myself, I can only say that I prefer his earlier like animated series stuff to the later films that he does because I think he had more depth and dimension and heart in the early characterization than in the later ones he seems to have done away with some of the 
duality that made his performance the most iconic. Like it mm. is much more straightforward, just extreme gruff all the time. Again, I don't know the games, but I still have a, a real high regard for this early stuff. Well, and it's not even so much like the acting that I'm criticizing. It's just literally the delivery, the vocal delivery. Mm. I don't like. I don't like the speed of it, and I don't like the timbre of it. And again, it sounds like he kind of has a cold. Not so much like the character, his portrayal of the character, whether he has, whether he's just angry man all the time or other things. I just don't like the sound of his voice in comparison to the later stuff. The sound of it. The sound of it. It's music to my ears. Roger. Um, I really only have for cons that there's just a couple of dumb lines, you know, and that's just true of any episode of this show, you know, the grumpy thing or whatever. That's really all I could fault it for. Same boat. I don't love young brat Robin because yeah. I just don't like children. Yeah, I don't like that aspect of kids, and I don't like anybody who is a little bitch about stuff. And so some, sometimes <laughs> he's sometimes he's crossing that line. <laughs> Trifecta. I wrote for detective. Yes. Well, it's more like this is, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is Robin's trifecta for this episode, kind of more than anything. Sure. Yeah, I mean, oh, how much of an acrobat is Robin? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he swings from that tree branch really eloquently out the window. Yeah, off the manor. So that was pretty impressive. Uh, his uh, motorcycle trick, like you said at the end, that's yeah. extremely ninja. <laughs> I like the sequence where they are fencing and he's first training young Dick. He's training his dick. <laughs> he says you left it at that. <laughs> he says it's finesse not strength I like that and then in practicing sword play with dick and then in parentheses I wrote but still can't fight <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any other ninja oh I, I did even though I complained about the fight choreography in this his jujitsu when he was undercover was really cool yeah and that's what I said like it's the, him not being as good a fighter I don't think it's like an animation limitation. That's it's a choice. Like a choice they made mm-hmm. because the the way they animate his fighting is really good and convincing. I think the fight scene in the very beginning in the construction site is really cool, especially considering the environment. It, it, you can't do everything in a place like that. You have to balance on all these beams and stuff. So that's tricky. No, and that's cool. There's always like a platform nearby. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's a, yeah, yeah. There's always some suspended board somewhere for you to utilize. That's true. You can use it like we're a the, diving board. Where the window washing stuff. jokers are machine gunning you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I do like that fight scene in the alley because it seems very practical. And also, he's unaided by any of his other tools. That's just him hand to hand combat with some vagrant trauma. It's Robin's it's, trauma. Yeah, it's not like it really comes across, but it is his trauma related to Robin's trauma is what drives the entire story. Yeah, I'd still take it back to that one scene of them in front of the portrait of Thomas and Martha as being sort of the gravestone in phantasm scene, you know, like of this show. I think it's very clear without being a constant discussion or something. But I think more than that, it's about the elephant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's more about his time in the circus. I know how much of a sore spot that elephant is to you, Dick. Don't worry about Dumbo. I got Dumbo. Don't even worry about it. I'll handle that. I did it because I care about you. I know you fucking hate those things. And then around. When I was a boy, an elephant harassed me and my family, too. And I... Yeah. And you around... don't know how much I understand. Rating? Four and a half. I can't argue with that. It's, Ben's going to give it a two. Two. A two. And it's solid, not because it was poorly made. Solid. You're not joking? No. And it's not. And I, it goes <laughs> back, some of it goes back to what I say when I say like, the numbers are a weird thing, giving things a numerical rating. Just in terms of how much I enjoyed watching it, it's like a two. It didn't hold my attention or engage me all that much. Jesus Christ. I wasn't doing sweet combos. I wasn't collecting new costumes. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. That. What am I supposed to do with my hands? Yeah. <laughs> Put them down your pants. Yeah, what? 
Yeah, you enjoy everything that you experience that much more if your hands are down your pants, everybody. Take that, life lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I have gone back and forth between a, a four and a half and a five, and I think that in terms of the show that I would probably give it a five, like contained within the show that it's it's one of my favorite episodes. And I think in a broader sense, put it up next to, you know, Keaton or Phantasm or anything else. And I think it's a solid four and a half, you know. Phantasm doesn't really have any of the dumb lines here and there. But otherwise, I, I love it. This is a good stuff for me. No. He spent a long time shaking his head. Yeah, it's just, I mean, when you say it like that, I'm even more secure in my two. Because holding it up against <laughs> any of that stuff, it doesn't. Like, I, for me, it doesn't hold up against Batman 89, which, I, as I said before, I'm not even that into that movie. But that's a more entertaining and engaging experience. How have we lasted um, a full year? <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I just... <laughs> this show has been torture for me. That, You've been dragging me through this. It sucks. I hate no, Batman. No, I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't, that's what I say when it's a two. It's not a two in that, like, oh man, I'll never get that time of my life back and I'm very upset with you about it. It's just like, it wasn't, it didn't do anything for me. And a part of it, I think it's because it's an origin story, again, for characters that I already know eight different versions of their backstories. So another one, it's just like, eh. And you're not the young person you maybe seeing this stuff for the first time or anything? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. But and you could do that with anything, or like how I said with Dark Knight, I would give it a different review the first three times I watched it than this most recent time, having seen it way more than that. But this is the time that I saw it, and this is what we're talking about. So it's like a one. <laughs> so God, upon, he yeah, doubles yeah, let, down. You should probably watch it again and then get back to us again. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is Robin. Thanks for checking out the Bad Fanatic podcast with Sammy Warman. All right, that is it, my friends. Thank you again for checking us out. And we've got one episode left after this. All right, it's going to be the end of our first season, this first year. It's been fantastic. So we appreciate everybody who's been following. Again, please screenshot it, spread the word, share it to your stories, repost us. Give us the five-star rating on iTunes. Help spread the love. And we will be back. All right, we got one episode left. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but it's a doozy, all right? So stay tuned for one last episode, the season finale, year one of the Bad Fanatic podcast. All right, thank you guys so much from myself and Ben and Evan. Take care. Jesus Christ. Thank him, praise him. <laughs> Pray to him yes. that he can... Do something to change Ben's mind. Yeah, dear Lord God. <laughs> they already made all the ben money off this show. Everybody loves it. It's okay if I don't love it. Desperately needs a change of heart. I, think something... Batman, I like Batman Beyond much more than the animated series. What? Jesus yeah. fucking Christ. Oh, roll around in that. You oh, are. Roll around in that. <laughs> Never. Take that controversy. Never in the last decade of our friendship has the slight age difference become more apparent than today where you're favoring the video games and the fucking Batman Beyond and froze right on that point. above oh, no. <laughs> the animated series. Jesus Christ. I watched all of this. I have all those same experiences come home after school and watch this. So I watched all of this, but it's just shway. I like future stuff. It's faster. <laughs> better, better action scenes. So you still get Kevin Conroy's Batman. And he's even gruffer and angrier. He's kind of like a Dark Knight Returns Batman. Just sitting in a fucking chair, though. It's his mind. is his real power. Neat. <laughs> ben, likes, ben likes neon lights, too, so that's, yes. that, that plays a factor. Jesus oh, yeah. Christ. He likes Blade Runner. He likes, he likes Blade Runner. He likes Drive. He likes Batman Beyond. This episode took a nosedive. <laughs> we don't have what to you, agree with What you did you say some more curse words and dick jokes? <laughs>